Yeah. So hello, thank you for having me. I'm going to talk about Hotwire and View Component uh, uh, that we can use uh, to build a, a modern front end, uh, well, a modern monolith application uh, in Ruby on Rails. So a couple of words about me. My name is Yaroslav Shmarov. I'm from Ukraine. I speak a few languages. You might have seen me on Twitter. You might have seen my YouTube uh, channel, Super Rails. Uh, there are quite a lot of videos about Hotwire there. Uh, or my blog that has been visited by around 200 Ruby on Rails developers daily, and uh, maybe on Udemy. So uh, I work at a French startup named uh, Barra, and uh, I was hired to do a really specific job. I was hired initially to be kind of a uh, front-end, uh, or let's say, yeah, kind of a front-end developer. So like to work with Tailwind, with Stimulus, with uh, Hotfire. And uh, previously, like the company is a few years old, but uh, around uh, the year 2020, the company made uh, a pivot. Previously, they were using uh, Rails, Graf GraphQL, and React. And uh, when pivoting, they decided that they don't really like need the stack. And anyway, they were writing the application, and uh, this new hot thing, hot wire came out. So why not give it a shot? And uh, basically, the company decided to try. Hotwire and View Component uh, instead of uh, uh, having a separate front end and a separate back end. And uh, before I continue, like a uh, couple of uh, thoughts about uh, React versus uh, Hotwire. So uh, I think that uh, Hotwire is really great uh, when you are just iterating, when uh, you are just on early stages, when there aren't so many developers, uh, and generally, like. Uh, uh, I would be building a React application when I uh, have uh, to have an API that I would still be sending to a mobile application. Uh, Hotwire, I mean, you can build desktop experiences really fast. And uh, thinking further from this, like uh, React uh, would be something I would be using for like uh, a B2C uh, product. So like when there are lots of consumers, consumers usually uh, uh, con consume something from their phone, and uh, like uh, web is uh, mostly for B2B, for people who use uh, laptops uh, at work, so like a desktop experience. And generally, like, uh, I don't think it's really right to compare like Hotwire is better or React is uh, better. There's like different tools uh, for different jobs. For example, uh, uh, I mean, Hotwire is just like server side rendering, it's at the core. And uh, like with Hotwire, you can't build a mirror clone. Uh, uh, you just can't do it with server-side rendering. You can't build a Figma. You can't build uh, an online version of Photoshop. Uh, you can't build a good, like I, I would say, Notion clone or something. But you can build still a lot. Like you can definitely build some kind of Jira, like any kind of information management system. You can build uh, uh, Twitch. I mean, uh, there are like uh, different components that uh, get updated uh, separately from each other. You can build an Amazon, uh, a Salesforce, you can build uh, uh, a Facebook, at least the desktop experience. Funny that like Facebook uh, created React, but uh, you can build a Facebook, at least the version using, using modern Hotfire. And coming back to the company where I work in and uh, to our stack. So uh, on the front end, we've got Hotfire, we've got View Component, we've got Tailwind, and just recently we moved away from Webpacker to CSS and JS bundling. And this is uh, maybe my favorite uh, uh, PR that was merged in the last year. So uh, you can have a look at like the files added and files uh, removed, it is awesome. And the build time uh, decreased from around like 40 seconds to, I know, uh, well, maybe five, but like uh, you don't even already notice it. So uh, it really made the developer experience much better. It wasn't uh, an easy migration. It took uh, some time to figure stuff out, but it was 100% worth it. Okay, and uh, now, talking about uh, like structuring the front end in Ruby on Rails. Like you've got helpers, you've got uh, decorators, uh, you've got partials, you've got templates. Uh, uh, I would say that there are some problems with helpers and decorators. Like uh, decorators are object specific and helpers are global. Like you define anything in application helper or in like uh, events helper, whatever, you can uh, access it anywhere. You can have uh, like a created at uh, in, that would be conflicting between two helpers. And the creators, like you decorate an object. And uh, 
it doesn't really solve the problem of uh, like uh, having the components in your front end, like you would have, I don't know, in React, for example. And uh, going back once again, like uh, how does it start? How does the cooperation between uh, the design team and the front end team work? Like the design team can possibly provide some kind of Figma designs. For example, here is a screenshot of like the design team uh, at uh, our company who created uh, some badges. So you see there are a lot of different variants of badges. And how would you implement it in uh, like Rails partials or templates? Well, uh, that can get kind of uh, a bit tricky. But view components uh, can make it really easy. So. Uh, here is actually how we implemented it uh, using view components. Uh, and it is uh, like on our staging environment, so like uh, the designers can see what we've uh, actually achieved. So here is the design, and here is uh, the design that we actually implemented. And uh, here is how it looks on the background. So we have a view component uh, .rb file that uh, uh, kind of describes uh, what can be in the batch component, different sizes, different rent variants. We've added some validations. We've got a CSS file that describes uh, the CSS uh, that should be rendered uh, based on different variants. And you see we've got a really small uh, HTML file. Like the HTML file for all these uh, variants is just 10 lines. And uh, Looking more at this HTML file, here is a really interesting uh, kind of finding and learning that we made uh, using view component. Like uh, you can have a fixed uh, set of uh, variants, like black, green, blue, or, like big, small, uh, medium, whatever. But uh, you will always uh, have the, you'll always want to add some kind of uh, custom CSS at some point. And instead of adding like additional variants, you can just like uh, append the uh, CSS classes to your current classes. So uh, here, uh, for example, we've got like this uh, collection of CSS classes. There are some uh, classes that uh, are taken from the CSS file, some classes that you can add manually. And I think this is like a great learning. Same with the data attributes. Uh, like a view component can have uh, some default data attributes uh, from a stimulus controller, but you can extend it to have additional data attributes. So you don't have to like rewrite the component or create an additional component. This makes these uh, view components more flexible. And uh, another interesting observation when working with view component, like uh, there can be object specific view comp components and there can be like global view components. For example, this uh, batch component, like uh, I would pass a lot of different parameters, like color green, size medium, and so on. But in some view components, I want to just pass an object. So here I have like an inventory component. I pass an inventory component, and based on this uh, like record, different stuff gets rendered. So you see inside that .rb file, I have a lot of like conditionals. I might have some kind of collections and so on. And uh, this .rb file defines what gets what gets rendered in the HTML. So it kind of encapsulates the logic, the rendering logic of uh, this object. And you don't have to like uh, store it uh, uh, mixed with other logic in your decorator, for example and definitely not the model. So uh, I would say like view component is really important for uh, structuring your front end and creating like front end components. Yeah, and another thing like uh, you can definitely place view components inside view components. So here, uh, these two things like you see, I've got a view component and I render other components inside this component. And uh, again, like uh, to emphasize, like there are general view components here. I pass a color, and it can be like anything, label anything, or I can just pass uh, a record. It's like another type of uh, view component, and I would already have uh, like different stuff from this particular record inside the HTML file. Now, uh, should you write uh, CSS files specific to each view component? Really, it depends. You can uh, have all your CSS file in application CSS. You can structure it any way you want. But uh, in some cases, when you have like a lot of uh, uh, CSS specific to a specific uh, component, it might be just more comfortable for file structure and to create a separate CSS file for a specific uh, view component. So the answer is it depends. <laughs> 
And uh, I would say the biggest challenge uh, when uh, like uh, actually building front-end components is uh, creating the uh, form inputs. So here I have a couple of examples where I have like a custom drop-down or like uh, a multi-select where I have an option to select all, where I have an option to search. So uh, on the background there's like a big mix of uh, 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 of uh, stimulus and uh, of uh, view component. So uh, yeah, this was a real challenge to build these like uh, form inputs. In the background, there is like a hidden form, and uh, this is like uh, stuff is submitted to this form uh, through this fancy kind of front end thing via stimulus. And again, uh, you don't have to make all uh, uh, like you don't have to say, okay, I'm not using uh, templates, I'm not using partials, I'm just using view component. Uh, it really depends on the use case, and uh, not everything has to be a view component, but it's possible. Like here is an example, a uh, regular show action uh, usually would have a template, but you would also uh, have a view component instead of this template. So it's possible to kind of replace templates and partial with a view component if you really want to. And uh, the second part of the talk, uh, Hotwire. So, uh, I think everybody has heard that, okay, Hotwire is like Turbo Frames, Turbo uh, Streams, uh, Stimulus JS, uh, and regular Turbo. So, uh, an important thing about Hotwire, it's not like Rails specific. So, it can exist outside of Rails and can be used by uh, other frameworks. You can just like uh, plug in Stimulus uh, or Turbo Streams into an HTML page, whatever. And uh, as a Nice example, there is like Turbo Laravel. Uh, it's kind of uh, an extension of uh, uh, Hotwire for, for being used inside uh, Laravel. So uh, like Hotwire is not Rails specific and it's really important to understand. That. That's why it's uh, also like branded differently and marketed differently and so on. And uh, looking further at uh, Hotwire, one uh, thing that people often get mixed with. So uh, in, in Turbo Streams, there are basically like two different things. There are HTTP turbo streams, and there are broadcasts that are going via WebSockets. And the, the WebSocket broadcasts uh, are kind of uh, rail specific. So uh, this part of turbo streams does not uh, uh, just work out of the box with the uh, other stuff, but uh, the HTTP part does work with the other stuff. And going back, like five years back, I think many of you have uh, uh, tried using kind of Ajax and uh, js.erb templates. So in a way, Turbo Streams, uh, uh, the HTTP Turbo Streams are kind of rebranded uh, uh, js.erb templates where you could like uh, get an element by ID and replace it with some kind of HTML or with some kind of partial. So, uh, Again, Turbo Streams HTTP and WebSocket funds. And now uh, I would like to show a live demo. So like uh, in the last uh, over a year, uh, we've developed a lot of really fancy stuff using Hotfire and I would like to show you like some capabilities of what you can build. So uh, here, for example, is just an index page where I have a list of records. I will refresh the page. And you see uh, each record gets loaded uh, asynchronously. If I go to inspect element, let's go to the network tab, and uh, I refresh the page. Okay, let's scroll down. And you see as I scroll, new requests uh, are received from the server and new records are being loaded. So this way you don't load a heavy page uh, just uh, with all the records, but like as you, whenever you need the records, like when the, the element gets visible in the, the screen, then it gets loaded. And uh, there isn't like one point of failure. Like for example, if uh, there is a problem with loading one of the records, uh, it will just not load, but it will not like uh, block the whole page. And uh, again, instead of like having one really heavy request, you can have like uh, 20 uh, smaller requests. Then on the same page, for example, uh, let me try to search for something. So I try searching, and you see uh, the reset filters button got uh, well, appeared because some filters have been applied and the URL has been updated, and there was no page refresh. I keep typing, and the stuff gets uh, updated. Uh, I try to add uh, some kind of filter, and you see the button appears. 
uh, in the future slides, I'm going to show a bit uh, of the background, how it works. And uh, just in comparison, this is like a new design we've done. And previously, like a year ago, we had another, another kind of index page where we had uh, similar functionality, but it wasn't uh, built that nicely. And like here, for example, the URL does not update. So in this case, we built it uh, just using Turbo Streams. And in this case, we used uh, a beautiful mixture of Turbo Streams and Turbo Frames. Uh, going further. So here, for example, I've got a page. And whenever you open this page, uh, if the user sees this page for the first time, then a model is going to pop up. So you see, I uh, like close this page. I like made it always uh, to pop up, but uh, a model gets popped up whenever you load the page. Then here, it's kind of a like, type form-like survey. So I can select something, I click Done, and it uh, brings me to the next st stage. I click Done, and brings me to the next stage. Well, I should switch off this like model re-rendering, but uh, like a multi-step form where you can select different stuff and uh, here, for example, I can add uh, something, I can like search, I have multiple tabs, and you see it's uh, all built with uh, turbo frames and turbo streams, and uh, you don't have to like have uh, page refreshes, models, so uh, it uh, really creates a seamless experience. Here, for example, uh, I've got a form with a few nested attributes, and uh, let's say I change the record. Uh, okay. So whenever I change something, uh, it updates, whether it was like automatically classified or you've uh, changed something. So uh, let me click Review. So here, again, I've already submitted the form. And let's say I uh, try to change something. And only if something has changed, the Submit button gets uh, visible. So uh, you can also make it like this, that uh, like, uh, submit button gets visible only when something actually gets uh, changed in uh, a form. And on the background, each time I uh, uh, click something in this form, it sends a request to the server. The server sees whether the new attributes are different from the previous attributes. And if they are different, then uh, it re-renders the update button uh, that would be uh, not disabled. Uh, going further, for example, uh, multi-step forms. So here I create, uh, well, I select uh, one of these, I click Next, uh, I get uh, some conditions, I can uh, uh, render form errors, I go Next. So again, multi-step forms without any page refreshers uh, that work really seamlessly using uh, Turbo Frames. Or, for example, here I've got like an API tokens page. The idea is that uh, you give a token a name, and then you click Generate Token, and uh, it shows this token only once. You won't have the possibility to see this token again. And what I do, I just render a turbo stream with uh, this uh, information that you see only when you create this new record. And there's no way to see it again. And uh, here is one of my favorite UIs, kind of a folder-like structure. So you can search. Uh, you can uh, go from one folder to another folder to another folder and select something. So again, uh, you can build a lot of different stuff uh, using Turbo Streams and Turbo Frames and Stimulus. And uh, let's go through uh, what I've just showed a bit uh, deeper. So. Uh, I think one of the greatest uh, killer features of Turbo Frames are like uh, asynchronous loadings of different parts of the page. So as I've showed previously, uh, you load the page and different uh, elements can load uh, separately. So again, uh, I keep scrolling and uh, new requests uh, uh, get sent to the server and you get new records visible. And uh, here's how it works on the background. Basically, on the index page, I've got uh, like a list of uh, risk events, well, a list of records. And uh, for each record, there is a URL that uh, like go to the show page and render the show page of this record. And inside the, the controller, I've got like render this, uh, uh, render this uh, view component. And inside the view component, I have a turbo frame with this ID of this record and the data. 
So really quite simple. Like you write just a couple of lines of code, but you have this like really strong feature of uh, being able to have each record loaded in a separate request. Uh, going next, uh, uh, with Turbo Frames, you can uh, create models really easy. So uh, uh, models can be above your content. They work uh, separately. They don't uh, make full page refreshes. Everything happens inside uh, uh, the context of this uh, kind of uh, Turbo Frame model. And uh, again, like uh, with Turbo Frames, you can have a lot of kind of iframes. So here, for example, on YouTube, as an example, there is a video that has been played, there is a chat, and there is a, a comment section. And each of them can be up updated separately, and you can potentially navigate inside of each section separately without having a page refresh. So only the stuff uh, inside this frame gets uh, refreshed uh, based on what you do. And uh, when working with Turbo Streams, there are a lot of things that you will, uh, uh, like, 99% uh, do inside your application. So there are a few kind of defaults that uh, you will most likely have. Basically, a Turbo Stream for current user to be able to push uh, some kind of notifications to a specific user, like uh, somebody has DM'd you or you've got a new message or uh, something like that. Then a Turbo Stream to send like uh, some kind of uh, notification to everybody who has uh, uh, the application on. So kind of global notifications, you'll want, you'll want to have a, a, an empty tag for a Turbo Frame model and potentially an empty tag for flash notifications. And uh, yeah, like some stimulus controllers that I see in uh, each uh, uh, Hotwire application that I touch is like drop downs, tabs, checkboxes, uh, debounce, so like submit uh, after a few milliseconds, uh, copy paste, uh, and hotkeys like click enter to submit or something like that. And uh, importantly, like Turbo Frames, Turbo Streams, and Stimulus, they can be used uh, absolutely separately from each other. So like uh, uh, you don't need uh, Turbo Frames to make Turbo Streams work. And uh, it's really important because uh, when I was studying and I've noticed it that many people like uh, you tend to think that like you need uh, to render a stream inside a Turbo Frame or something like that. So these are like kind of separate technologies that are kind of part of one stack, but they don't really need each other to work. But uh, if you uh, learn how to mix them correctly, you can build really beautiful things. So here, for example, uh, is an example. Uh, from this first page, let me, from this page, basically, whenever I type something here, this main content section gets reloaded. So it is inside the Turbo Frame tag. There is a Turbo Action Advance that updates the URL, and uh, there are a couple of Turbo Streams that uh, update this reset filters that is not part of this uh, Turbo Frame, and that uh, updates the filters count. That is also not part of the Turbo Frame. Uh, yeah, another example is with the uh, infinite pagination. So here, inside a Turbo Stream, I render Turbo Frame. In the previous examples, we were rendering the uh, Turbo Streams inside frames, and here we render frames inside streams. And it's uh, like just a few lines of code that lets you add infinite pagination to your application. And uh, Again, like uh, I know many Ruby on Rails developers don't want to use uh, JS or like try to like, okay, I'm a backend developer, I don't use JS, uh, but uh, just a couple of lines of JS uh, can really take you a long way when you use uh, the Hotwire stack. And like uh, the stimulus JS framework is uh, really simple to learn and uh, I'm really enjoying it and uh, uh, it can really make your Turbo frame, frames and streams uh, uh, work on a whole new level. So here, for example, uh, again with this like uh, model that pops up whenever you open the page. On the background, it works like this. There is a stimulus controller that uh, conditionally uh, clicks on a link. And here on the bottom is the link uh, to a path. I say that I want to open it in the model and uh, I conditionally click on this link. So whenever a user uh, opens the page, uh, the stimulus controller loads, and on connect, it clicks on this uh, hidden link. And that's the way uh, this model is being rendered. 
Or uh, another thing I really like uh, is uh, like dy dynamic forms. Like uh, there's always the problem, a classical problem, I would say, with like country, city, state, select, and you can really easily solve it uh, using the uh, hot fire. So here in this example, I've got uh, a stimulus controller that clicks on a specific link. And here I have a form. So in the form, there is a hidden button that uh, re-renders this new action with the params that I have submitted. And uh, I've got a turbo frame. And basically, whenever you uh, select country, it clicks on this uh, hidden button and re-renders the form, or at least this part of the form, with the params that you have submitted. So whenever I select country, it re-renders uh, the country, city, and state with the params that I have submitted. And uh, it makes uh, like this multi-step forms really easy to create. Um, yeah, another funny thing, uh, or like challenge I've had is, uh, let's say I've got a form and uh, conditionally I want like new fields to be added to this form. And how can I like, uh, uh, define uh, the form, like there is a form text field, for example, and like uh, I need to send it to a specific form. So uh, I would provide uh, a unique ID to the form, and uh, in the like top stream action, I would uh, uh, have form text field, and like uh, for the form not to be undefined, I uh, specify that the form should be the new post form, and uh, I've got a placeholder, this body placeholder, where I would uh, render this uh, text field with the body. So again, going back, how much JS do you need? Not much, but it can really take you a long way. And uh, well, some challenges that uh, we've had when uh, like starting to work with Hotfire. First of all, like uh, we've got uh, a couple of designers that previously used to work on uh, React, and uh, they had this kind of React uh, framework in their head, and like they knew what can be achieved with React, or like how it would look in React, and they had to kind of change their mindset a bit. So, for example, like in React, you can have like uh, beautiful uh, animations and transitioning from one page to another, whatever, and uh, that would be a bit more tricky to implement uh, in the uh, hot fire. Then again. A problem with any new technology, like how far can you go with it? Uh, what can you actually achieve? What is the limit? And uh, I would say, like the default frames, streams, uh, uh, and stimulus, uh, they are quite limited. But uh, when you use them in a beautiful combination, as I've showed previously, then uh, uh, their functionality becomes much more extended. And uh, a funny thing, like about stimulus, about uh, uh, turbo frames uh, and streams, uh, what can and can't be in one div. So, for example, here I've got uh, like a search field on top, and I've got some uh, like uh, uh, status select, origin select on the bottom. And uh, in the red part, I've got like some other parts that should not be part of this form. So. Uh, if you just like try to structure the HTML somehow, then uh, like you would want to uh, search and add to be like in one div and uh, the lower part to be in another div, and uh, you would need to like find the right way to build this. So you should also be aware a bit of like uh, what should be in what div and how can it uh, play with each other. And in this specific example, on the bottom. Uh, with all these like filters, status, origin type, uh, we had a form, and the search component is just a text field ta tag that targets this form. So it's not uh, in the HTML, it's not part of the form, but uh, it targets this specific form. And takeaways. I didn't find a better picture for takeaways. Yeah. So view component is uh, really an important uh, part of this like uh, Ruby Rails monolith stack, and uh, it really helps you to structure your front end and uh, also to communicate with uh, the design team. Then uh, Hotfire is not Rails specific, and it can exist outside of Rails. Frames and streams. 
uh, you don't have to use them uh, together, like uh, to do the same thing on the ver uh, beginning. I actually encourage you, like, to try to use uh, frames and streams separately. Uh, there are things that uh, both of them can do well. Uh, you'll, you will learn for yourself that uh, there are some things that are better done with streams, some things that are better done with frames, and uh, already later when you like uh, try to kind of fill fill each of them, you can uh, learn how to combine them to build like really beautiful interactions. And again, like the name is the naming is always a bit confusing, but like there are HTTP and WebSocket uh, Turbo streams, and these are kind of uh, quite different technologies. Like the HTTP ones uh, respond to requests that, that you send, and like you get updates on your screen, and the WebSocket ones like get uh, uh, send these updates to anybody who is listening to the same channel as uh, uh, you. And like uh, a bit of stimulus JS, like uh, I've shown you a couple of controllers uh, that have just like two or three lines in them, and they can really massively like uh, extend the functionalities of uh, your tuba frames, tuba frames and tuba streams. And uh, let's say like uh, okay, you just took everything you can out of uh, like uh, hot wire and. Uh, you still need more. Well, there is more. There are other technologies that uh, can uh, further extend uh, the capabilities of what you can achieve building a, a server-side rendering uh, monolith. Uh, there is stimulus reflex and uh, any cable that uh, really uh, really extends the functionality of uh, action cable. And uh, well, in a world where hot wire doesn't exist. There are still other server-side rendering uh, technologies. Some of them are like HTMX or, as many of you have heard, like Phoenix Live View. And uh, in a world where view component wouldn't exist, possibly I would try something like Flex. So it's uh, kind of a new uh, thing that is developed uh, uh, to be a potential substitute to like view component uh, and stuff. So there are alternatives. And uh, that's basically it. So uh, uh, feel free to find me on Twitter. And uh, and yeah, thank you. Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, I really like the slide where did you where you compared uh, the uh, hot wire with React. That was really insightful. Uh, I'm curious how it is uh, about testing. Uh, because, for example, with React code base, I have this experience that okay, you can test like that. You know, you have this component on your page, and you can test it, but you always uh, supply. You have to supply it with some data, with some you know information to that component, and this is often artificial. It can get get out of sync with what is provided by the backend, and I imagine that because I assume that it's possible to test these view components from like from mm -hmm. Rails. It's maybe easier to like have like real data put somewhere inside, like inside these components, right? Yeah. So uh, you can make uh, regular assertions, like you can uh, create a, a spec file and add some kind of assertions. Like uh, uh, you can add a factor with some kind of object, and uh, like based on this object, have different assertions of like what you want or you don't want to see. Also, you can uh, do snapshot testing. So, uh, like, you can create automatic snapshots of uh, your view components and uh, kind of see if anything has changed based on what you've uh, done. Also, uh, like, uh, system tests, you can use regular Rails system tests uh, to test flows of, like, uh, uh, data that you received from uh, a Tubo stream request, so, uh, or, like, a Tubo frame request. Uh, so it's quite easy to test, like uh, system tests uh, for flows and uh, specific components can be tested with uh, assertions or snapshots. So like, I assume that you have worked with React code bases before and so that you, uh, can you compare like uh, what in your opinion is like better or easier to test or something like that, like React code base in Rails somewhere versus the view component one? Uh, I mean, uh, for me, uh, I like writing the uh, Ruby, and uh, it's uh, easy to write uh, just like uh, Ruby assertions for view components, and uh, that's what I feel comfortable with personally. 
Okay, guys, thanks a lot. Uh, I hope. Uh, yeah, I hope uh, you got inspired by these like UIs that we've built uh, and that I've demoed, and uh, you'll uh, give a try to this kind of server side rendering and uh, exploring uh, yourself the limits of uh, what Hotwire can offer.